Pyrrhonism was a school of skepticism founded by Pyrrho in the 4th century BC. It is best known through the surviving works of Sextus Empiricus, writing in the late 2nd century or early 3rd century AD. Origins Pyrrho of Elis c. 360 c. 270 BC usually is credited with founding this school of skeptical philosophy. He travelled to India with Alexander the Great's army and studied with the Magi and the Gymnosophists. Pyrrhonism as a school was either revitalised or re-founded by Ainsidemus in the 1st century BC. Philosophy Pyrrhonism's objective is principally psychological, although it is best known for its epistemological arguments, particularly the problem of the criterion and the problem of induction. Through epike suspension of judgment, the mind is brought to ataraxia, a state of equanimity. As in Stoicism and Epicureanism, eudaimonia is the Pyrrhonist goal of life, and all three philosophies placed it in ataraxia or apathia. According to the Pyrrhonists, it is one's opinions about non-evident matters that prevent one from attaining eudaimonia. The main principle of Pyrrho's thought is expressed by the word akatalepsia, which connotes the ability to withhold assent from doctrines regarding the truth of things in their own nature, against every statement its contradiction may be advanced with equal justification. Pyrrhonists withhold assent with regard to non-evident propositions, that is, dogma. They disputed that the dogmatists had found truth regarding non-evident matters. For any non-evident matter, a Pyrrhonist tries to make the arguments for and against such that the matter cannot be concluded, thus suspending belief. According to Pyrrhonism, even the statement that nothing can be known is dogmatic. They thus attempted to make their skepticism universal, and to escape the reproach of basing it upon a fresh dogmatism. Mental imperturbability ataraxia was the result to be attained by cultivating such a frame of mind. Pyrrhonians or Pyrrhonism can be subdivided into those who are affected a suspension of judgment, zetetic, engaged in seeking, or aporetic, engaged in refutation. Pyrrhonism is credited with being the first Western school of philosophy to identify the problem of induction, and the Munchausen trilemma. Practice Pyrrhonist practice is for the purpose of achieving epike, i.e., suspension of judgment. The core practice is through setting argument against argument. To aid in this, the Pyrrhonist philosophers Ainsidemus and Agrippa developed sets of stock arguments. Topic the ten modes of Ainsidemus The same impressions are not produced by the same objects owing to the differences in animals, the same impressions are not produced by the same objects owing to the differences among human beings. The same impressions are not produced by the same objects owing to the differences among the senses. Owing to the circumstances, conditions or dispositions, the same objects appear different. The same temperature, as established by instrument, feels very different after an extended period of cold winter weather it feels warm than after mild weather in the autumn it feels cold. Time appears slow when young and fast as aging proceeds. Honey tastes sweet to most but bitter to someone with jaundice. A person with influenza will feel cold and shiver even though she is hot with a fever. Based on positions, distances, and locations, for owing to each of these the same objects appear different, the same tower appears rectangular at close distance and round from far away. The moon looks like a perfect sphere to the human eye, yet cratered from the view of a telescope. We deduce that since no object strikes us entirely by itself, but along with something else, it may perhaps be possible to say what the mixture compounded out of the external object and the thing perceived with it is like, but we would not be able to say what the external object is like by itself, based, as we said, on the quantity and constitution of the underlying objects, meaning generally by constitution, the manner of composition, so, for example, goat horn appears black when intact and appears white when ground up. Snow appears white when frozen and translucent as a liquid. Since all things appear relative, we will suspend judgment about what things exist absolutely and really existent. Do things which exist differentially as opposed to those things that have a distinct existence of their own, differ from relative things or not? 
If they do not differ, then they too are relative, but if they differ, then, since everything which differs is relative to something, things which exist absolutely are relative, based on constancy or rarity of occurrence, the sun is more amazing than a comet, but because we see and feel the warmth of the sun daily and the comet rarely, the latter commands our attention. There is a tenth mode, which is mainly concerned with ethics, being based on rules of conduct, habits, laws, legendary beliefs, and dogmatic conceptions. Superordinate to these ten modes stand three other modes, I, that based on the subject who judges modes 1, 2, 3 and 4. 2, that based on the object judged modes 7 and 10. 3, that based on both subject who judges and object judged modes 5, 6, 8 and 9. Superordinate to these three modes is the mode of relation. Topic: The five modes of Agrippa. These tropes or modes are given by Sextus Empiricus in his Outlines of Pyrrhonism. According to Sextus, they are attributed only to the more recent skeptics, and it is by Diogenes Laertius that we attribute them to Agrippa. The tropes are: descent, the uncertainty demonstrated by the differences of opinions among philosophers and people in general. Progress ad infinitum, all proof rests on matters themselves in need of proof, and so on to infinity. Relation, all things are changed as their relations become changed, or, as we look upon them from different points of view. Assumption, the truth asserted is based on an unsupported assumption. Circularity, the truth asserted involves a circularity of proofs. According to the mode deriving from dispute, we find that undecidable dissension about the matter proposed has come about both in ordinary life and among philosophers. Because of this we are not able to choose or to rule out anything, and we end up with suspension of judgment. In the mode deriving from infinite regress, we say that what is brought forward as a source of conviction for the matter proposed itself needs another such source, which itself needs another, and so ad infinitum, so that we have no point from which to begin to establish anything, and suspension of judgment follows. In the mode deriving from relativity, as we said above, the existing object appears to be such and such relative to the subject judging and to the things observed together with it, but we suspend judgment on what it is like in its nature. We have the mode from hypothesis when the dogmatists, being thrown back ad infinitum, begin from something which they do not establish but claim to assume simply and without proof in virtue of a concession. The reciprocal mode occurs when what ought to be confirmatory of the object under investigation needs to be made convincing by the object under investigation, then, being unable to take either in order to establish the other, we suspend judgment about both. With reference to these five tropes, that the first and third are a short summary of the earlier ten modes of Ainsidemus. The three additional ones show a progress in the Pyrrhonist system, building upon the objections derived from the fallibility of sense and opinion to more abstract and metaphysical grounds. According to Victor Brochard, the five tropes can be regarded as the most radical and most precise formulation of skepticism that has ever been given. In a sense, they are still irresistible today. Topic. Texts Except for the works of Sextus Empiricus and Diogenes Laertius, the texts about ancient Pyrrhonism have been lost, except for a summary of Pyrrhonian discourses by Ainsidemus, preserved by Photius, and a summary of Pyrrho's teaching preserved by Eusebius, quoting Aristocles, quoting Pyrrho's student Timon, in what is known as the Aristocles passage. Whoever wants eudaimonia to live well must consider these three questions. First, how are pragmata ethical matters, affairs, topics by nature? Secondly, what attitude should we adopt towards them? Thirdly, what will be the outcome for those who have this attitude? Pyrrho's answer is that. As for pragmata, they are all adiaphora, indifferentiated by a logical differentia, astithmeta, unstable, unbalanced, not measurable, and anepikrita, unjudged, unfixed, undecidable. Therefore, neither our sense perceptions nor our doxy views, theories, beliefs tell us the truth or lie, so we certainly should not rely on them. Rather, we should be adoxtus without views, aclinase uninclined toward this side or that, and acridontus unwavering in our refusal to choose, saying about every single one that it no more is than it is not or it both is and is not or it neither is nor is not. The outcome for those who actually adopt this attitude, says Timon, will be first aphasia speechlessness, non-assertion and then ataraxia freedom from disturbance, and Ainsidemus says pleasure. Topic. 
Similarities with Buddhism Adiaphora, Astithmeta, and Anepikrita are strikingly similar to the Buddhist three marks of existence, suggesting that Piro's teaching is based on what he learned in India, which is what Diogenes Laertius reported. Other similarities between Pyrrhonism and Buddhism include a version of the Tetralemma among the Pyrrhonist maxims and a parallel with the Buddhist Two Truths doctrine. In Pyrrhonism, the Buddhist concept of ultimate Paramartha truth corresponds with truth as defined via the criterion of truth, which in Pyrrhonism is seen as undemonstrated, and therefore nothing can be called true, with respect of it being an account of reality. The Buddhist concept of conventional or provisional Samvyarti truth corresponds in Pyrrhonism to truth defined via the Pyrrhonist criterion of action, which is used for making decisions about what to do. Influence The Pyrrhonist school influenced and had substantial overlap with the empiric school of medicine. Many of the well-known Pyrrhonist teachers were also empirics, including, Sextus Empiricus, Herodotus of Tarsus, Heraclides, Theodas, and Monodotus. However, Sextus Empiricus said that Pyrrhonism had more in common with the methodic school in that it follow s the appearances and take s from these whatever seems expedient. Because of the high degree of similarity between the Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna's Madhyamaka philosophy and Pyrrhonism, particularly as detailed in the surviving works of Sextus Empiricus, Thomas McEvely suspects that Nagarjuna was influenced by Greek Pyrrhonist texts imported into India, a revival of the use of Pyrrhonism as a synonym for skepticism occurred during the 17th century fallibilism as a modern fundamental perspective of the scientific method as put forth by Karl Popper and Charles Sanders Peirce that all knowledge is at best an approximation and that any scientist always must stipulate this in her or his research and findings it is in effect a modernized extension of pyrrhonism indeed historic pyrrhonists sometimes are described by modern authors as fallibilists and modern fallibilists sometimes are described as pyrrhonists List of Pyrrhonist philosophers Ainsidemus Agrippa the Skeptic Arcesilaus Robert Fogelin Heraclides of Tarentum Herodotus of Tarsus Benson Mates Monodotus of Nicomedia Michel de Montaigne Nosophanes Pyrrho Sextus Empiricus Theodas of Laodicea Timon See also Academic skepticism Ijnana Apophysis Apophatic theology Quietism Epochy E-prime Nassim Nicholas Taleb Trivialism <todic>